Okay, today we're looking at the first part of my Michael Moorcock collection. These are the Demi hardcovers. And I'm pretty sure that everything I'm going to show you today is a first. I think I only have first hardcovers with Moorcock. Um, he was the author who started me collecting way, way back in 1984. And I started collecting in terms of buying hardcovers only in first editions when I started working in a bookshop in Cardiff, the first bookshop I worked in, which was Bows and Bows in Cardiff in September, October 1984. And the first book I bought um, in hardcover when I worked there was this book, The Opium General and Other Stories. And that was my first first edition hardcover buy and that was a new book then and I think I ordered it in specially um, let's just have a look I got Mike to sign it for me a couple of years later um, this is a signature loads of my Moorcock first to sign because um, I met him several times hosted him for events and yeah 84 so that that was the that was the beginning of my collecting hardcover first editions that was the Opium General and other stories I was very keen to get this because it included what was then the final Jerry Cornelius adventure, um, The Alchemist's Question, which is absolutely fantastic novella. And that sort of put the Cornelius Chronicles to an end, even though they have been one or two since then. Talking of Michael Moorcock is difficult because people used to come to me when I was a bookseller in the 80s and say, how do I begin reading Michael Moorcock? And I would kind of laugh because really <laughs> there's no ideal place to start um, except based on your taste. This is Peg and the President, the most recent Cornelius adventure, um, which I personally didn't like very much. I just thought it was um, sort of Moorcock and Jerry Cornelius by numbers and I really wasn't that fussed on it. Um, but I'm just pulling that out of the way so I've got some room to move to show you the other books from the collection. But yeah, I used to think, well, how can I, how can you begin? Because all of Moorcock's fiction is connected. It's all one part of a mega multiverse novel um, called The Eternal Champion Cycle. And some people say that some of the more mainstream books are not part of this, but they are all connected. All of them contain little references to the others if you know how to look, where to look and what to look for. So the secret really with Moorcock is what he did was he wrote Singletons, um, he's still writing obviously, it's series. Um, a lot of the series you can read, you know, discreetly as they are. So it's important with the series that you probably read those with an individual order. But in terms of the multiverse series altogether, there is no real reading order. There are two climaxes, two different alternate endings. So really the idea of going through them book by book chronologically or in some sort of sequence. It just doesn't really make any sense. So you just have to take on board the fact that the eternal champion sequence, the basic idea is that there are characters throughout time and space who are all basically the same being. They're an avatar um, who balances the different, sort, different forces of law and chaos, of order and dispersion throughout the cosmos. And that's the basic idea. And Moorcock used that very, very cleverly and very commercially to hang the whole conceit on. So really, this is probably going to be more enjoyable to somebody who knows the sequence. If you don't know it, it's not a problem because really it's just about how beautiful the books are. Um, I wouldn't say these are roughly in chronological order in terms of publication, um, but um, there is a sort of element to that. So I'm going to start on the far left. And this is one of Moorcock's earliest novels, The Golden Barge. Um, which is written, I think, late 50s, early 60s, when he was finding his feet as a writer. Of course, he was born in 1939 in London, and um, he was, you know, writing from a very young age. By the age of 15, he was editing a comic or pop called Tarzan Adventures because he was an Edgar Rice Burroughs fan. And this is one of his earliest books. Let's just have a look at the date. Now, <clears throat> this wasn't published in hardcover until long after its original publication. There you go. Um, signed by Moorcock, introduction by M. John Harrison, which I completely forgotten that was in there. I must take a look at that. I should get um, Mike Harrison to sign that if I ever go into meeting him again. And this was issued in 
set, copyrighted in 79 by Savoy and reissued in 1983 by NEL. Um, this was quite uncommon, um, but this was a, an early novel. Um, so very beautiful as you can see, NEL did a few of them then, and that's the Golden Barge. It's one to look out for, lovely wraparound artwork. And um, you don't see this one very often. <coughs> A sequence that Moorcock wrote pretty much certainly for many is this one, the Michael Caine Warrior of Mars series. They were published, I think, in the States under the name Edward P. Bradbury, which is a kind of a reference to Ray Bradbury and Edgar Rice Burroughs. And I only bought this a few years ago, and it's in a bit of a state. It's got some chips in the jacket, um, NEL again, and um, contains City of the Beast, Lord of the Spiders, and Masters of the Pit. And these are fairly generic sort of um, ERB rip-offs with some flourishes. Um, great fun, you know, very pulpy, um, but the sort of thing that he wrote um, just to make some money. Because Moorcock, of course, really has is, is a man of two careers. He's a serious literary novelist um, and magazine editor of New World. That was his sort of real career focus. That was the artistic thing that sort of drove him on in the 60s. Um, was to edit a science fiction magazine that crossed over into other areas of culture and reunited it and was also a counterculture magazine. And to do that, he wrote lots of sort of novels. He just knocked off a lot of what some people would say are pot boilers, and those are mostly his fantasy novels. This kind of falls into that category. Um, his key sequence of the 60s as a science fiction writer, because of course, really, he's a fantasy writer. If you look at the tale of the eternal champion, as covering all his books and being one thing they are undeniably fantasy they have supernatural and magical elements so even the books that fall within that that appear to be science fiction are pretty much really fantasy as a result but his main sequence in the 60s which i think was serious was the jerry cornelius series and this is the first jerry cornelius novel the final program which is one of my favorite books and this is a first edition um, from alison and busby with drawings by mal dean and um, there's Maldine there, Moorcock there. And this is very, very, very scarce in this condition. I've had it for many, many, many years. And now it's probably, probably cost you at least 100, 150 quid, maybe more to get one in, in this sort of state. And um, that's one of my favorite books. Um, the first Jerry Cornelius novel. And I'm very, very fond of that indeed. I've read it and read it and read it. And right next to it is the second Jerry Cornelius novel kill for cancer and this is a first edition as well um i don't think actually i've got this this one signed i can't recall um this one's actually not signed because i bought this um a long time ago but not in the period when um i was seeing moorcock fairly regularly so that's something i need to address one day if i ever get the chance because mike these days he's had a lot of ill health and um you know he doesn't do a lot in public anymore um Cure for Cancer again, I bought this much later and inside, just popping out there, is a postcard of the Penguin um, paperback cover, which I do have a copy of that, it's a great one, you never find it in really good neck. Um, and funnily enough, that was the only one they did, they didn't do the others in the Cornelius sequence. And that's from a box set of Penguin science fiction postcards, which you can still get, which is fantastic, showing the covers of the books that they did. So that's Cure for Cancer, the second Jerry Cornelius novel. It's very, very psychedelic, very trippy. We really, really like that book. And a plain brown cover with Mike on the back there. Um, so <clears throat> those date back to the late 60s. And um, there were lots of Jerry Cornelius stories um, written by different hands. Um, and Mike wrote lots himself. And they don't really follow any linear narrative. This is an Alison and Busby um, edition from the late 70s. Um, I think that's a first. Let me just take a look at that. Um, let's see. Yeah, 76. So that's um, that's a first edition of that one. Uh, lovely mauve cover. And Alison and Busby, a little bit later than that, they did a really nice reissue of the final program with a buff cover and um, a lovely car on the cover with chocolate brown and sort of beige cover, which I don't have. I lent to my friend Steve Holmes many, many years ago. Hey, Steve, I know you watch the channel and I think he's probably still got it. So, um, but I don't mind because it's not a first. So that, that is a first. Um, interestingly, this next to it is a Harrop reissue from about 85, 86 of a different edition, um, Lives and Times of Jay Cornelius that has 
I think one extra story. There have been three different editions of this book. Um, not really sure about that depiction of Jerry myself, but quite nice. So as you see, there's various different publishers, NEL, Alison of Busby, Harab. <clears throat> Here's another NEL, and this is um, one of the later Cornelius novels, The Entropy Tango. This is really easy to pick up. I mean, this book used to be everywhere. I think it was remaindered. And this is a book about anarchy and anarchism, and it's very difficult to penetrate. Um, and it was very much the sort of thing that Moorcock was interested at the time. He was always very interested politically in, in anarchy. That was his thing. So that's that one. It says quite common. Unfortunately, spine faded, but there you go. This book here has a particular meaning to me. This is The Swords of Coram in um, Grafton. A beautiful omnibus issue from 1985. And um, this was bought for me by my partner. This is the first book she ever bought for me. And it's absolutely gorgeous, as you see. And it contains the first three Coram books, which are sword and sorcery novels. Knight of the Swords, Queen of the Swords and King of the Swords. And it's absolutely lovely. And Aside from having a fantastic jacket, um, it's got this lovely blue leatherette binding with silver gilt um, on the spine and really lovely feel to that. And sadly, when they did the sequel, here's the back, they didn't do the sequel in the same binding, which I really felt was a fail. And you obviously need to give that a clean there. There's a bit of residue of something on there. Um, so that, but that's one of, my, one of the most beautiful ones I think they did. I love these Grafton liveries that. Um, particular type is nice and this is the sequel Chronicles of Korra Bull and the Spear Oak and the Ram Sword and the Stallion and they just did plain boards for this which just wasn't as nice so plain boards just doesn't, doesn't work in the same way but again lovely book um, these are all quite uncommon now and again I think you know more or less all of these are signed by Mike because so I met him several times um, in the 80s 90s there you go um, so very, very nice. Again, a bit spine faded, unfortunately. I should look after that a bit better. And the Coram books before that had been published as singletons years earlier, I think in the 70s. And here are two of them, Oak and the Ram and the Sword and the Stallion. And those covers are by Keith Roberts, um, the Thomas Hardy of SF, English SF writer, who was also an illustrator. And they look very Celtic and they, they are basically set in kind of an alternate um, Cornwall they they almost very much feel like they're set in Cornwall um, and there's this sort of text textual clues that suggest that as well and at least one of these if not both were bought for me by my friend Tim um, and they're really really lovely old school jackets um, great fun and again these are much sought after I only have two when you see them they're usually in terrible nick that's the problem um, and um, again these are more recent so i haven't actually got those signed um, but that gives you a, an idea of what the original quorum books look like and these are two from that second trilogy so open the round sword and the stallion really 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 nice so but in the 80s Moorcock was really big and i used to sell loads and loads and loads of his books in different bookshops and people would come miles just to talk to me because i was regarded as a bit of an expert um, about how to read them you know what what way the sequences went, um, what to look for. And what you got in these books was resonance. You got similar events happening, mirroring each other, and you got what some critics called the frisson of recognition, which was very clever because you, it made you very hungry for it. It was quite a good commercial move um, without being too obvious. And of course, the books are generally quite small, fast moving. They're quite sort of gothic and colorful. And they've got some moral questions in them. Um, and they, they're very fabulous feel. They're much more interesting than the kind of fantasy novels you get today, which are rather overblown and they go on and on and on and on. And, you know, they have flawed characters and, you know, Moorcock really is a giant in that area. I mean, after the original sort of fantasy writers who followed in the wake of Robert E. Howard, people like Fritz Lieber, Jack Vance, Poul Anderson, you know, Moorcock then is, is the inheritor of that and the great British writer who took that mantle on and really sort of ran with it in the 60s and 70s. This is the Ice Schooner, um, which is a big influence over the second book by Philip Reeve, that children's author who wrote Mortal Engines, the, um, the one about the moving cities, which itself is a bit of a rip off of um, Inverted World by Christopher Priest. His second book is very, very like the Ice Schooner. 
um, and um, that's a sort of great um, Jim Burns jacket there um, fantastic little book this there's um, Mike there in his 80s glory corduroy um, and you know Mike was winning lots of um, lots of acclaim then you know that he used to he used to be quite a sort of well-regarded figure in those days um, he'd won the Guardian Fiction Prep prize in the late 70s in the 80s he was producing amongst his best work in terms of the quality of the writing and still sort of working within genre boundaries and expanding them so that's a rather beautiful one there so great book that's technically a singleton what he's most famous for probably is the Elric novels um Elric the albino king of Melnibone which is a pre-human empire of elvish type characters who are very sort of decadent and wicked and they have no idea about morality and they've ruled the earth for a very long time and man is growing you know under their feet as they gradually become more decadent and withdrawn and this is the um the second elric novel the sailor on the seas of fate in quartet and that's a wonderful um cover by i would say that's chris achilleos let me just have a look at it um pretty sure that's achilleos Lip inside. No, it's Patrick Woodruff. Sorry, yes, it's Woodruff. Obviously, when you look at it close, it is obviously Woodruff, not Achilles. Um, Patrick Woodruff, a great fantasy artist, sort of underrated these days. I love that title, A Sailor on the Seas of Fate, and that's fantastic. That's again one of the more common ones that's out there. Um, great book. <clears throat> this is an interesting one. Um, this is again Quartet, and that's a Chris Foss cover. That's the Land Leviathan, um, a new scientific romance. And that's one of the Oswald Bas Bastable Nomad of Time series, which are often described as early cyberpunk novels. Um, and this is the second in that series. Um, really, really beautiful. And I think I bought this in the 90s. And lovely, lovely book. I mean, they just don't make them like that anymore. Wonderful Chris Foss cover, Quartet. An imprint which is possibly defunct there's mike on the back um you know lovely lovely book and again signed as nearly all of these are and absolutely beautiful and as i say some people regard those as key in the sort of early steampunk thing before steampunk was called steampunk because of course it wasn't called steampunk until the late 80s when kw jeter wrote a letter to Locus, the science fiction newspaper, and said, you know, my novel Morlock Knight is a steampunk novel because he was finding this whole idea of cyberpunk and calling everything something punk rather silly. So it came from that. This is one that I got comparatively recently. I bought this in 2019 in Hay on Wai um, from um, Derek Adaman, great um, books are in Hay on Why. And this is the second part of the sort of Chronicles of Coram. There's a tetralogy of four books, um, not Coram, sorry, Hawkmoon, Dorian Hawkmoon. Um, there's the Rune Staff is the first four, and then there's Chronicles of Castle Brass. And the Quest for Tainlaw, which is the third book in this, is the original climax of the entire sequence. I haven't read these for years and years and years. I really need to go back to them, but um, this was available in a paperback omnibus at the same time and I used to sell absolutely tons of these omnibuses that Granada did and Granada changed their name to Grafton. Um, I just used to sell masses and masses of them. They were A format so they were smaller than a B format and I got this I say only a couple of years ago. <coughs> One of my favourite jackets from Moorcock from the classic period of the, of the sort of 70s and 80s is this Rodney Matthews jacket for this omnibus edition of The Dances at the End of Time. Um, and that's the character called Lord Jagged of Canaria, and that's Rodney Matthews. This is a book club edition, sadly, um, but it's still absolutely beautiful. And it contains three wonderful witty novels, An Alien Heat, The Hollow Land, and The End of All Songs, which I think is a fantastic title. And these are very much in the sort of Jack Vance, Clark Ashton Smith, Viriconium, Dying Earth type thing, but they're very witty and light and, um, you know, the characters are really sort of silly and frothy and, and funny, um, but not in a sort of nerdy Pratchett-esque way, um, but absolutely beautiful. And Rodney Mathis, I mean, we were so blessed with the, the SF artists that we had back in the, the, the 70s and 80s in Britain. Rodney Mathis, Chris Achilleos, Patrick Woodruff, Jim Burns, 
you know, these people just did wonderful, wonderful work, beautiful work. And there are many others, of course, as well. So I'm just going to move the camera now and we'll have a look at the next tranche of the collection. What? <laughs> 